everybody watching online. We're so glad you're here. We got a brand new song for you this morning. Let's worship. I give you my attention, all my focus, pushing on the Welcome to The Bridge. My name is Josh. I'm Luke Ashley, one of the pastors here at The Bridge Church, and we are so glad that you are with us this morning. You can have a seat for a moment. Um, but before we give any announcements, anything further, can we just give a warm welcome to any of our first-time guests in the house this morning? We are so honored that you are here. Whether you're watching online for the first time or you are here with us physically, welcome to the Bridge Church. We hope that you are able to experience God in a brand new way this morning. And whether it's your first time or it's your hundredth time and you've just been hiding in the shadows of the balcony for the last year and a half, whatever it is, if we've never gotten to meet and you've never had the opportunity to get plugged in here at the Bridge Church, we would love to get to help you do that. And it's real simple. Just simply text the word new here to the number that's going to be on the screen. Someone from our team will get in touch with you. Again, it's not about like right going to hit you with like all the spam mail and stuff like that. We want to help you figure out the best ways that you can get plugged into community here at the Bridge Church, even if it's digitally and virtually. Um, but if you're in the room, don't just do the new here text. 
visit our Connect Hub on the way out and let them know that you are first time or that, hey, I'm first time saying hi, but I've been here for a year and a half. Either way, it all works, all right? And we've got a gift we wanna give you and just exchange some information again, just to help you figure out a way to get best plugged in for you in the time and season of life you are in right now at the Bridge Church, because there's a lot going on. Yeah, there is a lot going on, but another way you can get connected is in the seat back pocket in front of each of you is a Connect card. And on the Connect card, you can let us know if you've made any decisions, if you would like any more information, information. Um, but one of my favorite things is on the back of the Connect card, you can put prayer requests. And we are a church that believes in the power of prayer. So I would encourage you, fill this out, put your prayer requests so that the staff and the prayer team can pray over those each and every week. Absolutely. And it is an exciting week. It is Holy Week at the church, if you know what that is. This is the week leading up to Easter Sunday. You can give applause for that. It's all good. We are excited about Easter Sunday this coming weekend, um, and we've got a packed weekend here at the bridge coming up with an incredible opportunities for you to worship as we celebrate the, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, next weekend. And so we've got a few opportunities and ways for you to worship. The first is we're going to have an in-person Good Friday service here on campus at 630. This Friday, we will have childcare from six weeks old through pre-K, um, so you can sign up for that, and we'd love for you to come be a part of that. It's going to be a communion-based service. We're going to look at the Last Supper um, and Passover and just really understand what that means for us as we head into Easter Sunday. And then we have five... <clears throat> We have five identical services throughout Saturday and Sunday. We've got two on Saturday, 2.30 and 4.30, and then we've got three identical opportunities on Sunday, 7.30 a.m. for all you early birds, so probably not you, all right? Um, and then 9.30 and 11.30. Um, but here's what I wanna encourage you and ask you to do two things for us. First and foremost is register which service you and your friends, family, neighbors, the stranger on the street, whoever you're bringing, let us know what service you're coming to. Because we know that over Easter weekend, God will bless us with thousands of people walking through the doors. And what we wanna do is make sure that we can provide equally incredible and welcoming environments for each and every service and opportunity. And so the better we can be prepared of understanding who and how many people we think will be at each service, the better prepared we can be to welcome those people in. And if you've got a big crew coming with you, we're gonna encourage you, Saturday services, and then maybe you wake up a little early at 7.30 and you buy them brunch afterwards, all right? Um, but those are gonna be the best services to bring large groups to where it'll be easier to find parking and seats. Um, the second thing we would encourage you to do is don't come alone. Bring somebody with you. In fact, we've got some already pre-made. We're doing the hard work for you, all right? We have some pre-made invite packages. There's a little invite card for the service, some candy and Easter eggs. This isn't for you, okay? Don't detach this, then hand out the card. Hand out the whole package, all right? Grab a few on your way out. They're at the exit doors. Invite some people, and we'll see you this weekend for Easter. Yeah, and we are so expectant about what God is gonna do this weekend, but that provides the opportunity for you and for me to serve the people that come in this building. So I would encourage you, as you walk out, stop by the Connect Hub, sign up to serve at one of the five identical services that we have coming up. That's right, and part of that serving is how we express generosity, and we believe that that is something we are called to do as a church. It's something that we are, are, are trying to mark ourselves by as a church that's known for their generosity. And, but it's not just generosity of time, it's generosity with our finances, what God has blessed us with. And we believe that we are a giving church, and the reason we believe in that and the reason we push and promote that is because we believe that when we trust God with what he's entrusted us with, when we practice financial generosity, that God is worshiped by that and that lives are changed through it. Um, and we've got a number of local and global ministry partners in which we get to see the lives, lives change through them. Um, and one of them you got to meet a few weeks ago, Pastor Kenny, who is a pastor in England, and he is a missionary back to Pakistan, which is his home country. Um, and he's an incredible story. Um, but they were refugees and have been living as a refugee status in England for years. And when he was here, he got to share with us some exciting news that when he got back, the day after he got back, they were gonna be taking their vows to become true citizens of the United Kingdom. In fact, he sent us a little picture. So they are now legal UK citizens, which is huge for Ray Ministries because now that they have a permanent and legal home, he can travel freely for the missions and for what God has called them to do. And part of, through generosity, what we have asked you to do a few weeks ago 
was to help partner with us to go above and beyond to help offset some of those costs that they went through legally to become UK citizens so that they can continue to focus their missions back in Pakistan. And so we're excited to report that we were able to send them and bless them with an additional $2,500 this past week just to just tell them we love them. And so thank you guys for that generosity. And if you'd like to continue to partner with God through giving at the Bridge Church or take a step for the first time in doing so, you can give in one of three easy ways. We've got physical drop boxes in the room. You can give through the church website or our text to give option. Just text the amount you'd like to give to the number on the screen and you can set up as a one-time or a recurring gift of generosity. Either way, remember, God is worshiped and lives are changed. Absolutely. Amen. All right, let's stand up this morning. We're gonna continue to worship, but before we do... What is your favorite Easter moment in memory as a child? Tell somebody, tell your neighbor. Come on, y'all, let's continue to elevate the name of Jesus today. He is worthy to be praised. The joy comes in the morning today. Come on, lift your voices.
all, let's hear your voice today. Our melody is a weapon. Come on, we sing this. Sing a little louder. 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 Come on, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. All over in the underneath. Sing a little louder. Your weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Oh, heaven comes to fight. Come on, church. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. All louder than the underneath. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Come on, sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Come on, sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name Jesus, you deserve the praise. 
worthy you know this week is going to be a big week next weekend Easter a lot of people are going to be setting foot in churches all around the world to hear a message that for some of them they've heard it and it's kind of gone in one ear and out the other for a long time but this time it will have traction this time will be like the first time that they've ever heard it. For a lot of people, they're gonna find hope, they're gonna hear about a love that they never even dreamed possible. As the good news of Jesus is proclaimed, and even today, there's something powerful that God wants to do. And so I'm gonna ask you to join together, let's pray. Pray for what's happening this week, pray for Easter, and let's just lift ourselves up to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. You, Lord, are worthy of all of our praise. And God, we just thank you in advance for the, the move of God that you're gonna be bringing, not just today, but God, especially as we look to Easter. Father, we, we ask that you would already create a spiritual hunger inside of people, God, in a way that they can't explain where that hunger is coming from. They just know there's a hole in their souls that they want filled and that they're going to they're gonna respond to a calling that you're issuing to their hearts. They're going to hear a message. And God, we thank you in advance for all of those that are going to come to know you. Some of them are our own friends, family members. Some have been prayed for for decades. God, we thank you for what you're going to do, not just here, but around the world. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Haiti and at, at Rendezvous Church, God, that in a place where there's so much violence, so much darkness, so much difficulty going on, but Lord, they're going to bring a message of hope that people are desperate to hear. And, 
and people's lives are going to be changed forever, God. And we pray that you would place your hand upon that nation. And God, that you would just bring an incredible move of your spirit to bring the peace that they've been longing for for so long. Father, we lift up all the churches in our community. We lift up Bayside Community Church with Pastor Randy. We, we lift up Westside uh, Christian Church with Pastor Matt. We lift up North River Church in Palmetto with Pastor Michael. We lift up Oasis Church in East County with Pastor Steve. We, we lift up Hope City Church with Pastor Peter in Sarasota. Coast Life Church in Venice with Pastor Jason. And every church, God, that proclaims the good news. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do to bring glory to your name and the lives that you're going to change through it. And we're so grateful that we are a part of that story. And so, God, may you glorify yourself. And today, may you even make yourself known in ways, Lord, that some would never have expected. But we thank you and we praise you and we do declare that you are worthy, God, of all of it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. And we thank God, you guys. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, it's good to see you guys. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, if we have not yet met, I'm the legacy pastor here, which means I am the grandpa of the house. And, uh, and it's so good to be with you. So good for those of you that are able to join us online. Betsy uh, in Punta Gorda, uh, hope you're having a restful time away. Thank you for the impact that you make with the homeless right in our own community. Also want to say hi to Angela and Daniel that are watching. Thanks for joining us online. And, and, and here's something that I know, whether you're online or whether you're here, uh, right here present now, um, I don't know, um, I don't know what you walked in here with. Like, I don't, I don't know your stories. For many of you, I don't know um, your hurts. I don't know your, your, your habits. I don't know your hangups. I don't know your addictions, I don't know your struggles, I don't know your uh, shame, I don't know your pain, I don't know uh, anything about most of you and your history and everything that was in the past. I don't know what is in your past, but I do know what God is calling you to in the future. Like 100%. And no matter what your background is, and no matter what it is that you struggle with, and no matter where you are in life, I want you to know something, that, that God is fueled by a vision for your life. He's passionate about you, and he is a, he's fueled by a vision for you, and he's, 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 he, he made you, he created you, he knows how you operate. He knows what your struggles have been. He knows what your hang-ups have been. He knows the things that have kept you chained from becoming the person that you were created to be. And he is, he's moved. He is passionate with vision. He knows the person that you were created to be all along. And here's the truth. You may not believe in God, but God believes in you. Because even if you don't believe in him, he created you and he knows you. And he knows that you were created for something beautiful, something powerful. That there's something that, that is in you that can only be expressed through you in the unique way that it comes through you. That there is beauty that you can bring into this world. There is love that you can bring into this world. There is faith. There is hope. There's breakthrough that God can bring through you through a knowledge of who he is. And even if you don't believe in him, he believes in you. And you were actually his idea. And this is something that, that he has vision for. And, 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 and here's the thing. When we talk about freedom, oftentimes, you know, we kind of reduce it to, well, I'm an American, so I'm free. <laughs> How many of you realize you can actually be an American and not be free? Yeah. Right? Right? The kind of freedom that God offers is not this, you know, national type thing that we're talking about, as beautiful as that is. There's a freedom, a freedom that God offers is, is the knowledge of who he is, to walk with a sense of spiritual vitality, to be able to walk with a sense that God is your God, that, that Jesus is your Savior, to walk with a sense of his presence, his leadership, his guidance, to be able to walk in a path where you know that this is the path I was created for. This is the life that I was created for. 
To be able to relate and connect and walk in union with God and to be able to connect and walk in union with other people and to feel connected and experience all the life and the vitality that comes from the fullness of who God is and in the fullness of the relationships that you're created for. This drives God. And you know that you're living the life that you are called to when that is your passion too. And I want to encourage you this morning not to settle for anything less than that. I want to encourage you this morning to open up your heart to what it is that God wants to do. But here's what I can tell you, that when you find freedom, you're going to need to fight for it. Your freedom, your freedom is something that is worth fighting for. And when you have it, everything will seem like it's leverage to take it away from you. And so I want to give you some things here. I want to give you three things that I want you to hang on to. I believe God wants you to hang on to these things. These three things to be able to help you to fight for your freedom. I'm going to encourage you to write this down. I'm going to encourage you to make it into a tattoo, whatever you want to do. (laughs) Brand it on your brain, whatever it takes. But I'm telling you. Do not lose track of these things. Number one, the first thing that you need to understand about freedom is that there's nobody who's more passionate about your freedom than Christ. Nobody. There's nobody who's more personally invested in your freedom than Jesus Christ himself. When Jesus Christ came stepping into human history, into our world, fully God and fully man, And what he did was he took the rejection, he took the humiliation, humiliation, he took the constant arguments, and he loved us through it. And then he went through the torture and the rejection that culminated in time when he was nailed to a cross. And he took on that himself, on that cross, every single sin, every single foul thought, action, and deed that had ever been committed, and he said, I'll take the blame for it. And he died to pay for our sins. He was buried, and he didn't stay dead. After three days, he was raised from the dead. That's Easter. And in being raised from the dead, he proved that he has the power and the authority over death and life, uh, over death and evil and sin. And that God is able to free us from all of those things and connect us to the life that we were created for. And in so doing, he demonstrated this thing which we call the Passion Week. This coming week, we call it Passion Week. That's in church world, right? Leading up to Easter. Is it any wonder we call it Passion Week when we talk about what he did on our behalf? I can tell you that there is nobody who is more for you, nobody who is more personally invested in you beginning to to be able to discover the life you were created for. There's nobody who's as passionate about that other than Christ himself. And, and, and we can be so grateful for that. We can be so grateful. Not only is he passionate about it, but the Holy Spirit, according to the scriptures, prays for us and intercedes for us. So not only did Jesus do what he did, then he sent the Spirit, and the Spirit is actually praying and interceding, which I need. Because what I do is this. My prayers are very different than the Holy Spirit's prayers. I am sure of that. Because my prayers are like, God, I'm really ticked off. Can you tell those jerks to leave me alone? (laughs) Right? And what God is doing is, is is the Holy Spirit's going, I pray that you'll be free. That your capacity to love people will grow. That you'll stop defining your happiness by what people think of you or how they treat you. And see, the Spirit of God is always interceding and praying for my freedom because he's more passionate about my freedom than about my comfort. And he's saying for you. And the Apostle Paul is, is writing this letter to the Galatians. We've been talking about freedom all this month, and we've been talking about Paul's letter to the Galatians. And, and, and in this letter to the Galatians, he kind of says this big summary verse in Galatians 5, verse 1. And I, and I want to read this out loud together. Here's what it says. He said, it is for freedom that, out loud together, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Let's break that down a little bit. He says it's for freedom that Christ set us free. The purpose for it was your freedom. So don't use your freedom to make decisions that lead you back into slavery. 
Why? Because then you miss the point. It's for freedom that, that Christ set us free. Now, there's really two groups of people that he's talking to when he wrote the letter to the Galatians. And he's, and he's talking to a group of Jewish people that became followers of Jesus. And so the Jewish people, with all of their Jewish rules, with all of their Jewish regulations, with all of their judgments, don't eat with Gentiles, don't associate with non-Jewish people, those are Gentiles, with all of their rules, with all of their regulations, with all their, I, I need to try harder, I need to do better. He, he's talking to those Jewish people who have come to become followers of Jesus Christ, but he's also talking to a group of people that came out of the Galatian culture where sex was all over the map and they weren't Jewish and they wanted nothing to do with Jews and, and they were living just as wild as could be. And God has a vision for taking these two groups and bringing them together, two people that hated each other, two groups of people, this hostility, this racism that they all embraced. And God said, I've got a vision. And I want you to be free, and I want you to be free so that you could be free together. But right now, it's not working. And so he wrote Galatians. And so what he says to the Jews is he said this, stand firm and, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't allow yourself to fall back into religious slavery where you think it's performance-based or you think it's about being the right race or you think, and this is hard. When you've been raised with a lot of religion and had a lot of guilt and shame pounded into you, that's a hard thing to shake, isn't it? Some of you grew up that, how many of you grew up kind of with that message, right? And, and it's hard. Let me, let, me t let me show you just how hard it is. So the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10, he's praying one day on a rooftop and God gives him a vision. And in this vision, he says something, reveals something to Peter. Long story short, some guys come, they're being sent from somebody that you wouldn't expect. It was a Gentile. Peter goes and goes to the house of the Gentile, which a Jew is not supposed to do. And he's just following God, he follows the vision, follows the circumstances, and he ends up at the house of not just any Gentile, but the Roman occupation force, the foreign invaders who are keeping their heavy hand on the nation of Israel. He sends them to a military commander named Cornelius. He's a centurion. And Peter starts telling him about Jesus and he's, he's not even done. And the spirit of God falls upon Cornelius, falls upon his family. They begin to display gifts of the spirit. That Peter's like, what is going on here? Peter goes back and he tells the Jews that were now believers. He said, let me tell you what happened. Because they're like, what were you doing associating with Gentiles? And he's like... I'm just following God. God did this, and then the Spirit came upon these people, and God is offering them the gracious gift of repentance and salvation through Jesus, gave them the Spirit just like he gave us, and he was the first one, and he got the vision, and he understood it. Yet when you read in the letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians, actually Paul's account of his time there, Peter is with Jewish believers and they're just enjoying their time together and all this. And, and then some Gentile believers come along whose background was all over the map, all over the map. And, 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 Peter is with, and Peter is with them. Actually, excuse me, let me reverse that. He's with the Gentile believers, and he's fine. He's having a good time with them. Then some Jewish believers come, and he starts going, oh, I oh, this probably doesn't look good because they're Gentiles. And I, I, you know, we were raised kind of not, we shouldn't associate. And I, I, God's doing something, but I, I kind of care about what you guys think of me. And so, and what happens is, is Peter starts to distance himself from the Gentiles and gets closer to the Jews. And Paul says, in front of them all, I confronted Peter. Because Paul understood that, that there was a vision that God carried of freedom. And that Peter's hypocrisy in beginning to separate himself now from those who were also believers, but they were Gentiles, that it even affected Barnabas, the son of encouragement, that Barnabas began to care about what the religious people thought, and he began to separate too. And Peter said, you can't allow this to go viral. This is an infection. You can't do this. And he confronts Peter. Of all the people, 
Peter, the one who got the vision, the one who was the first of the Gentiles. It was so ingrained in him that even though God had done a miraculous move through him, he still got pulled back. For those of you that came out of very religious backgrounds, here's what I know what you struggle with. There's a part of you that goes, oh, this is awesome. I love this freedom I'm experiencing. Should I do this? What are my parents going to think? What is my family going to think? What is that? Well, I'm not sure. Is this okay? Like, I'm really joyful, but I was taught to beat myself up. I, can, I, can I do this? And what happens is, is it's, it's hard to shake. And there's a freedom that God has for you. And so he talks to the, the Jews. He says, look, don't let that religious yoke, slavery, pull you back into that. Don't do that. Walk in the freedom that God has for you. But then he also talks to the Gentiles. Because the Gentile Christians, they're like, I'm saved. Jesus died for all my sins, past, present, and future. I'm going to heaven. That means I can do whatever I want, have all the fun that I want. And Paul says, no, you don't understand. He says, he says this, look, Galatians 6, 8. He said, look, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. What is he talking about? A loss of vitality, a loss of a sense of connection with God, a loss of connection with the people around you that love you and that you love sense of loss of connection from other believers. He's saying, this will actually do the opposite. He says, and God's going to love you. He's not going to save you from the consequences. He's still going to love you. He said, but what's going to happen is you're going to experience that sense of disconnect. He said, but those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. And so he's, he's driven by this. There's nobody that's more passionate about your freedom. Christ came to set you free so you could be free. So don't use your freedom to choose to go back to the things that put you back in bondage. And so how have you used your freedom? What choices have you made with your freedom? Because not all choices that we make freely lead to freedom. Some choices lead us back into bondage. That's the, so, so nobody's more passionate about your freedom than Christ. Here's the second thing that you need to understand. Is that you can't be free if you don't hate your chains. Now you may go, oh, no, no, no. We all hate our chains, don't we? And the fact is we don't all hate our chains. In fact, this is some things we grew up with, some things we become accustomed to, some things we, we hang on to. And, and here's what I found is that in different seasons of life, different challenges will come, and how you respond to those challenges can either lead to a chain that chains you or can lead to a breakthrough. Even in a different season of life, a spouse goes through a change, and you feel like it's not the same person that I'm married, and now there's an adjustment period. How you respond to that can either lead to a chain or it can lead to freedom. Different seasons of life have different challenges. You'll discover that as you grow. And so one of the things that's cropped up in my life is, uh, many of you know this, but you know, my, my dad, we, we moved him down here, and... Um, he's not living with us, but we, I put him in independent living. My dad was showing signs of dementia. He has Alzheimer's. And, um, and I had him in independent living. And then in the beginning of December, I moved him into assisted living because it was clear that he needed a greater level of support. And he wasn't even in there for 60 days. And I had to move him into memory care. And so, like, and, and, and here's the deal. I get Fridays off. We get Fridays off as a staff. And it seemed like any time there was an emergency or any time there was a move or any time that anything happened, it was on a Friday, on a day off for me. And so what happened is I'd have a whole day planned out, and all of a sudden I'd get a phone call, and my whole day is shot, and now I'm involved with his care. And, and you know, and you deal with all this. I deal with all this guilt and, oh, I shouldn't feel this way, but man, when do I get a break? Like, my soul is weary. Have any of you ever been there? It's very real. And I'd be like, uh, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have my dad. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I could do this. I, I, all those things. And one, more, one day, it was a Friday morning, it was just in January. And I had a whole day planned out, and I was going to take Maria somewhere in the afternoon, and I was going to do some things. And at 7.30 a.m., I get a phone call. And I'm downstairs, 
And Maria was downstairs, and I, I go ahead and I take the phone call, and it's his facility, and something had happened. And it was, you know, if it's not falling down, it's throwing up. If it's not throwing up, it's going to the ER, whatever it is. And I just sat there, and, 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 and I could just feel myself just getting so frustrated. Like, when do I get a day off? When do I get a break? And I, and I, and I, and I got to with the phone call, and I started heading towards the steps to go to the bedroom to get dressed. And I just kind of start running. And Maria goes, what's the matter? What's going on? And I didn't say anything. And I, and I literally jumped up like to the third stair because I was just bolting, and I was mad. And as soon as my foot hit the step, I dropped an F-bomb. I, excuse me, I yelled an F-bomb. That's right, the queen mother of all swear words. <laughs> F dash dash dash, which I never say, which I find so deeply offensive, and it erupted out of me. And I was so angry. And, I, and, and what's happened is I find myself getting angry. And I go, is this a part of getting old? What is this? But I go from zero to 100 like that. And, and, I, and, I, and listen, I, it's, like, it's like it's so bad. We're dealing with a, a service that comes and does some stuff at the house, and they mess some things up. And so last week, Wednesday, I sent an email. Say, hey, you need to correct this. Very nice email. No response. So Thursday, I sent an email. I said, I sent an email to you yesterday. Haven't heard. And this needs to get corrected. And if it doesn't get corrected, things are going to get worse if you don't correct it. Didn't get a response. Friday, I left a voicemail. I need someone to call me because you guys need to get this squared away. And what they did was rather than ever call me or rather respond, they sent somebody out there who tried to remedy it and ended up making the situation worse. On the weekend, I took a look at it, realized they actually had made things worse. So Monday morning, I make a phone call. And when I call them, I, I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be pretty businesslike and all that stuff. But as soon as she went, hey, good morning, I could feel my voice starting to shake. <laughs> and basically what I said was, okay, so this is Mark Ald, and here's what happened. I sent you an email on Wednesday, no response. I sent you an email on Thursday, no call, no response. I left you a voicemail on Friday, no response. So here's exactly what you're going to do. You guys have made it worse. You're going to send out a supervisor out here today. They're going to give me a phone call before they come, and I will talk to them personally here because I'm this close to cutting you off. And she's stammering. On the phone, she's like, oh, okay, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get somebody out there. And, and then I get a, a phone call a few minutes later, and the guy goes, hi, Pastor Mark. I'm going to be coming out to look at the situation. And I go, thank you. And I hang up, and I go, really? <laughs> Pastor Mark, can I just be an angry, regular person today? And this anger thing, and you know, and, and listen, listen, you know, you, uh, as I talk about it, you may go, no, we, we get it. Listen, we totally understand. I went through the same thing that you did, and yeah, you get so raw, and, and, it, and it really gets hard, and, but you're, you're there for your dad, and I, listen, I get all of that. I get all that. I get that. But here's the problem for us. Here's the problem for me. Here's the problem for all of us. By the way, I'm getting help for this, <laughs> and I mean it. And here's the problem. There's always a reason. There's always a reason. Well, I did this because you did that. Well, I believe this way because this is the way I was raised. Well, I didn't have what you had when I was growing up, and so I don't need to do that. I, 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 that, I, that doesn't apply to me. There, what, and what happens is this, is that you and I... We don't hate our chains. We get used to our chains. We justify our chains. We say, this is because of my circumstances. That's why I have these, this problem that I'm dealing with. Or it's because of that person. That's why I have this problem that I'm dealing with. And let me tell you something. If we could hear in the spirit, I don't know what you came in here with, but I know what God heard. He heard a lot of this. And the problem is this is that we get used to our chains and we don't deal with it. 
We don't realize it. And so you can tell me, hey, I understand you're raw, you're taking care of your dad, that's a good thing and all that stuff. And I really do appreciate it, but that doesn't help me. Because I hate the person that I am when my anger gets the best of me. That's not the person I was created to be. There's a way to be angry. And there's a way not to be angry. And what's been coming out of me is not the way to be angry. And so I'm going to get some help on this. And, and, and everyone carries something. And, and, and maybe, you, you know, it's, it's something that you had so long that you can't even dream of not living with it. An addiction, a habit, a judgment, a pattern. Or maybe what you do to make yourself comfortable with your chains is you justify it. You go, I'm a hot-blooded Italian. What can I say? We have tempers. Soy Latino, mi sangre, right? <laughs> no, es bueno. <laughs> and so what we do is we come up with ways of getting comfortable with our chains. But the problem is this, is that God created us for so much more. He created you for so much more. And there's something that he wants to bring out and something that he wants to set you free from. But you cannot be free if you do not hate your chains. And if all you do is have reasons and explanations for the chains that you carry, you will never be free from it. And there's a life that you were created for that is so much bigger where your capacity to love is so much greater than any human capacity. Your capacity to reveal the grace of God, the love of God, the kindness of God is so much greater than the chain that you embrace. And so I don't want people to tell me that it's okay. I want to know how to get rid of it. I want to know what the root of this is. I've got to get down to the root because the fruit that I'm experiencing is not good. And there's a reason that this keeps coming up and I've got to find out what that is. And so here's what I can tell you. Some of you came in here and you have all kinds, there's all kinds of chains. Some of your chains are bitterness. But you're like, but if you knew what they did to me, and listen, if I knew what they did to you, I would be angry. No doubt. If I heard what happened to you, I'd be so angry. But that's not going to help you get free. Amen. Until you begin to look at how your chains are creating disconnects and breakdowns in your relationships, you won't hate them. You won't hate it until you begin to take inventory of all the broken relationships and all the people that have been hurt, people that have loved you, people that care for you. You won't hate your chains until you begin to open up your eyes and are willing to look at the fact that this is the opposite of what God has for you, that he wants to knit you together with others, have you experience the fullness of relationships and a fullness of a connection with him. So we need to learn to hate the chains that we carry. Some of the chains that you carry is, well, I didn't have a parent that believed in me. I never had that. And so I'm just going to settle here for I'm not going to try. Um, I don't want to fail. And so I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to try anything. And you have no idea the beauty that God wants to bring through you. And this becomes your chain. The fear of failure becomes your chain. For some of you, the fear of success is your chain. Like, I don't deserve this. The way I've, I've lived my life, the way I've been, and God is like calling you to something great, and you're like, oh, but you know what? I, that, I, I just don't deserve that. I just, and God is like, do you understand that when you have success, you're, and you're afraid that if I'm successful, that means I'm corrupt because rich people are corrupt people. And God's like, you, had it ever occurred to you that I want to take you in righteousness, help you to become successful, and you can be part of funding some amazing things that are going to change people's lives? Have you ever considered that there's another thing? To do that, you've got to let go of your chains. You've got to let go of the bitterness, the identity struggles, all the things that we hang on to. And, 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 but you can't be free if you don't hate it. And, and here's the deal. When you deal with this stuff, understand you're not just doing this for you. You're not just, a, you are doing it, yeah. Your relationship with God, your connection with other people. But some of these things represent generational cycles of dysfunction that have followed your family. And you are the first one that goes, I'm done with this. I am not going to put up with this anymore. And you become the first one to go, God has a bigger vision for our family than what we've been living with. 
And so I'm going to deal with it, and I'm going to speak out about the addiction, about the abuse, about the things that have gone on in the cycles of our family. And I don't care what anybody thinks, because God has a vision for freedom. And here's what happens when you take that step. You're not the only one that's going to get set free. Your children who see you are going to go, I didn't think you could change at that age. And they're going to see you, and they're going to realize, I don't have to have a future that looks like the future of all my relatives and family. There's actually a greater future that God has for me, and you're going to open up vision for the lives of your own family, your own children. When your children hear you call them and go, look, I have been such a bitter, angry person. I am so sorry for the way that my politics or my attitudes or my opinions or my judgments have affected you. Please forgive me. God is showing me that's not the way to live, that there's a greater life that he has for me, and it has to do with love and connection, so will you please forgive me? And when your kids hear you make a phone call like that, and they're like, I never thought I'd hear those words come out of you. They're going to realize there are possibilities with God, and suddenly God will be able to give them vision for a higher calling upon their life, too. See, we don't do this just for ourselves. There's a purpose to your freedom. Matter of fact, one of the things we learned this, this past week, we were doing uh, some emotional training development uh, with the staff, and Avery Royal was talking about the fact that that you know when you've had a trauma that, is, that has happened to you and you don't deal with that trauma... There's a change, not just psychologically, that affects you. There's actually, it, 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 it touches you on a cellular level, biological. They call it epigenetics. And what it is is you, you literally hold that trauma in your body, and then when you have children and you raise your children, there are things that you can pass on that creates anxiety in your children, and they don't know where it came from. And it came from the fact that you weren't willing to deal with the trauma that you went through. And so here's what happens. When you're willing to deal with the trauma, when you're willing to deal with the things that chain you, there's a freedom that God will bring into your life, and your children can see that there's a way to respond to this, and they can find healing too. And so whenever we find healing from the chains that hold us, we're not just doing it for ourselves. There's a greater purpose. How can you hate your chains? You can hate them because you see what is happening to the generations that follow you. And you can say, that's not going to happen on my watch. And that's when you go, it's yours, God. It's yours. It's yours. Guys, that was an easy drop, but it's a hard road. But when you're willing to go down that path with God, God will set you free from the cycles of dysfunction. And when you open up your heart to God's passion and vision for your life, God will lead you to an increased capacity to love. And you'll be a part of something so much bigger, which leads us to the third thing. The third thing that you got to remember is this, is that freedom from only comes when you discover what you're freed to. Freedom from your past, freedom from your sin, freedom from your brokenness, freedom from those things really comes when you discover what you're freed to. If you're just free and you stop there, you're actually not going to experience the level of freedom that God has for you. Take a look. Galatians 5.13 says this, for you have been called to live in freedom. As a matter of fact, say this out loud with me. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. He says you are called. You know what a, you know what a great parent does? A great parent looks for qualities in their children. And when they see the good qualities in their children, they call it out. They call it, they'll go, man, I saw how you were kind to that other child. I'm so excited. I'm so proud of you when I see how you are kind to the other child. It makes me so excited about the kind of man you're going to grow up to be. Hey, honey, I saw how you didn't give up on a basketball team when nobody, nobody passed the ball to you, but how you still cheered everybody else on. When I see what kind of encouragement you give in a situation like that, I'm so excited about the kind of young lady you're going to bring, uh, who's going to bring encouragement and love into this world. I'm so excited for you. And there's a calling out and a vision that goes with it. Well, I, I can't wait to see the kind of person that you're going to grow up 
to be. Freedom has the same thing. God calls it out of you. He sees it. He sees your potential. He knows why he, you, he created you. He knows what will make you come alive. He knows exactly how you're going to bring his grace into the world, his love, his, his, his beauty, all of that. He knows how you are designed to do that, and he calls it out of you. He says, I see it. Nobody may have seen it, but I do. And here's, a, here's the truth, guys. You might not believe in God because nobody ever believed in you. But God believes in you even if you don't believe in him because you are his idea. And he says, but I created you and I know you and I know what will make you come alive. And he says, so it's not going back to the sinful nature. It's like, hey, there's, you were saved from some stuff. But you were saved from those things because now you can lead others down a path of healing to find life. That's what this is about. And it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a, a coming full circle, right? You get f- set free from something, that's great. But if all you do is stop the behavior, you actually haven't found freedom yet. As a matter of fact, in AA, any of my AA people out there, right? In AA, if somebody just stops drinking and that's all that happens, what do we call them? Dry a dry drunk. Which means, yeah, you stop drinking, but you still a mess inside. And the fact is, is, hey, freedom is great. Stopping this is great. Yeah, breaking free from this. But what happens is it comes full circle. And even though this is like awesome to, to be able to begin to break free, real freedom happens when you find God working through you to lead others to freedom. And you watch their lives change and you realize this is a life that's greater than a life that I ever imagined. This is something so much bigger than that. And this has to drive us. So how are you using your freedom? Are you using it? Are you helping other people find the path? He said, don't use it to satisfy your sinful nature. 513, he says it this way at the end of it. He said, instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Complete the circle. Don't use it for this. Use it for this. Freedom from happens when you discover what you're free to. A friend, uh, David Kyle Foster, he just uh, posted on Facebook, texted me, and then he posted that he's going under hospice care. And David, David was a gay actor in Hollywood. And David started out with New Age and following a guru and out in California and, and all this stuff. And he ended up finding Jesus Christ. Had an absolute incredible experience with God. And David kept finding himself tempted to go back, have another encounter, have another encounter, have another encounter. And he said something that I will never forget. He said, I realized that I could go and do that and God is still going to love me. He's going to love me. He's not going to stop loving me just because I went back to slavery. And he said, I thought, God's going to still love me, but I'm going to make myself miserable. Why do I want to keep making myself miserable? I don't want to keep making myself miserable. I'm tired of making myself miserable. And knowing that God would love him no matter what actually turned him towards God. And he was able to find freedom. You see, the Bible says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's knowing that God will love me that draws me to him and enables me to turn away from sin. And then David took his journey and he launched a whole ministry that has served thousands, helped people find freedom. Wound it down just recently as he's in this season of his life. And what David did is he took the chains of his past, got freed from it, and knew he was freed to help other people find freedom. That's you and that's me too. And the spiritual vitality of the life, 
that you get to experience knowing that God is doing something amazing through you. Through me? Yeah. And that God takes all of this. He takes all of this that once held you. He takes all of this when he sets you free from it. Like a father who sees in you the potential that nobody else sees. And he calls it out. And you may go, well, I just never had a parent who believed in me. And so I'm just going to stay here. And he goes, but I see it. I see your potential. I see the beauty that I have in store for you. I see everything that I want to bring through you. Let it go. Listen to my voice. Let me free you from the opinions of others. Let me free you from trying to fill the hole in your soul with those drugs, with those encounters, with all those other things. And then let me free you to make a difference in the lives of people where I change their lives through your journey. And that's the vitality. Listen, I, I, I don't know when you came in here what you came in with. I don't know what pain, what shame, what baggage, what bitterness, what beliefs you had about yourself that nobody sees you and you're inadequate and there's nothing that God could ever do with you. I don't know what you came in here with, but I, I don't know where you're coming from, but I do know that what God is calling you to and what he's calling you to is a life that is so full of vitality and joy and peace and strength and beauty that the very best version of you comes out and that your connection with him and your connection with other people just begins to flourish. And that people who see God's life coming through you that way find themselves drawn to that life. So I don't know what, what chain you need to give God. I know which ones I'm giving him but you got to hate it. And for some of you, the beginning of this means you'll cross the line of faith where you go, God, I'm going to give you my life. I haven't believed, but God, today I'm going to believe. Today I'm going to believe that this is true. I'm going to believe your word. I'm going to believe that you love me. I'm going to believe that you created me. I'm going to believe that there is a vision you have for my life. And today I'm going to give you my life. And for some of you, that is the step you need to take. Nobody's loved you like Jesus. Nobody's paid for your sin. Nobody's imparted their spirit into you. Nobody's offering the kind of life because nobody else can, but he can. So I'm going to ask you guys just to close your eyes. If you would, bow your head. And if today, right where you are, if you, if you go, today I want to cross that line of faith. Today I want to give God my life. Today I want to step into that. I want to be forgiven of everything I've ever done. I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. I want to begin to experience the life that he created me for. I'm going to ask you just with everyone's eyes closed and head bowed, you just put your hand in the air because I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. This is different than religion. This is the beginning of a relationship. So I'm going to pray for you. I'll also, you can put your hands down. Thank you. For those of you that go, today i got to give him a chain that I know I've been hanging on to. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's an unwillingness to deal with some trauma. Maybe Whatever that is, maybe it's a, a belief that I'll never amount to anything, and that's the chain that holds you back. Maybe it's the fear of failure. Maybe it's the fear of success. Whatever that is. Maybe it's defining yourself and who you are by your own stained, darkened opinion rather than receiving from him the label that you could become a child of his. Whatever that chain is, you've got to give that to him. Watch what he does. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now. Lord, take every chain. Better yet, put it in the heart of everyone who's holding on to it, and they know what it is because you showed it to them, that they just give it to you. I'm going to ask you where you are. You just say, God, I give you this chain. God, I give you this chain. God, I give you this chain. You just give it to him. Give it to him. He takes it. God, I pray that you would replace that chain the path of freedom 
a sense of your vitality, a sense of your delight, a sense of your grace, a sense of your love, that you'd overwhelm them, God, with that. For those of you that need to take the step of faith and cross over that line and give him your life, I'm just gonna ask, we'll just pray together. You just pray with me right now. Just say this, dear Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I believe you love me. I believe you created me. And I want the life you have for me. So forgive me of all my sin. Come into my life. Expand my capacity to love so that it looks like you. Send your spirit into me from this day forward. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys, we're going to take a moment. Yeah, you can, you can give him thanks. You can praise him. You can praise him. We're going to open up some space here. If you just want to process some things, maybe physically you feel like I need to lay something down, we'll also have our prayer team that will be up here if you want to talk to them. But we're just going to take these moments and let God continue this work in you. In Jesus' name.
few things for you. First of all, uh, can we just thank God again for his goodness and his grace? Thank you so much, Father. Thank you. Um, before you go, a few things. For those of you that said, hey, I need to cross the line of faith. And today, you stepped out of religion. You stepped out of whatever was you brought in, and you stepped into this relationship with Christ. Don't stop there. Make sure you stop by the Connect Hub. Uh, we've got a Bible for you that is, is really good and uh, helps you to take those first steps. And we want to take some first steps with you. Uh, baptism at the beach is coming up May 5th. You'll want to be a part of that. That's going to be good. And uh, for those of you that are watching online, uh, you can get that same uh, Bible if you text the word GRACE, G-R-A-C-E, to the number on your screens. And we'll get that out uh, to you as well. Now, you got people around you in your world, your orbit. And they don't know what freedom looks like. They don't know the depth of God's love for them. But they're in your orbit for a reason. And I'm going to ask you to just kind of place them in your hands. And I want you to think seriously about this. They need to know. And if they don't hear from you, how are they going to know? Sometimes it's as simple as inviting them to church, but don't just hand them a card, though that's a good thing to do. Invite them to sit with you. Say, come with me, Easter. There's something you're going to hear that it's just going to blow your mind. But I just want you to take those people in your hands right now, and we're just going to lift them up. We're going to ask for God to carry his vision into their lives in a way that will change them forever. And so may God work through you to free you from every chain that keeps you, from experiencing the fullness of the life and the vitality with which you were created. And may the Spirit of God live in you with such a vibrance, with such a joy, with such a strength that those in your orbit are drawn to Jesus through you. And may God take your journey of freedom and through you, help them to find that same path to Jesus Christ. May God do something powerful through you, through all of it. And may it be so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you good Friday.